Welcome to the Individual Matters podcast guest feature series. I'm Andrew Caton, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. She's a wife, mother, and lifelong dyslexic who's kind enough to join us on the air today to share her experiences with learning about dyslexia, managing it, and living with it. Welcome, Megan. Thank you very much for coming on and talking about this. Yeah. I guess the first question is, how and when did you find out that you have dyslexia? So I remember being really little, and I think I was like in kindergarten or preschool, and sitting on the mat, and the teachers would like go over like... um, how to count uh, numbers like uh, two by twos or and then like when they started to teach us how to read I remember being in first grade and they'd send us back with a worksheet and everybody around me kind of knew what was going on and I had no clue and or we'd be singing songs and I couldn't remember the lyrics in order or like the days of the week I couldn't remember the days of the week like and I and I just kind of was I knew I was different, that like everybody else seemed to be getting it around me, but I wasn't getting it. And thankfully, my mother, who I suspect is also dyslexic, um, was a teacher and she, um, before she had my sister and I, and she picked up really quickly that something was off. And she went in to talk to the teacher and the teacher told my mother that she thought I was just not smart, just kind of dumb. Mm. And my mom refused to accept that. And she went to the principal and said, it was when I was in first grade, she basically had it out with him and said, you need to test her. I'm going to hold you responsible if you don't test her. So they had me formally tested. And sure enough, I was dyslexic, auditory processing, and um, ADHD. And thankfully, I was so young then that it didn't really have a chance to really affect my self-esteem as much because immediately my mom uh, decided she needed, she didn't want me to be being pulled out in school. So she searched for a school and there was one um, that was about 20 minutes away from us that was for kids with learning disabilities. So she took me out of the public school and she put me into the school where I had five kids in my class to start with. And um, they taught me differently And I just remember hating phonics and like going through phonics and just being awful. And then I had the teacher, she would come during the summer and um, she would uh, teach me during the summer too until I don't know what exactly happened, but it clicked and I knew how to read. And she taught me in a different way and it worked. And I went to the school until I was in fifth grade. But I ended up loving to read, and they put me back into the public school, I think in sixth grade, and I was in AP English, and like honors English after that, and didn't even think about the fact that I had a learning disability for years after that um, until I got into Spanish, <laughs> and that was horrific. <laughs> mm. And so... So when you were... When you first got diagnosed and then you went to the school, you never felt like, I mean, you used the term disability and dyslexia. It is a, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, but you didn't feel like there was something wrong. You just had, tell me about how that, knowing that helped you. It was really helpful because, and it was really helpful for my family because um, I was being singled out before that. It's like, there's something wrong with her. Like, why isn't she catching on? And when I went to the other school, all of the kids were somewhat like me. And it, really, dyslexia isn't, there isn't something wrong with you if you're dyslexic. It's that really there's something wrong with the way they teach you. It's not something wrong that's, that's, that's wrong with the kid. It's something wrong with the way we teach them. Dyslexics are brilliant. You just have to teach them in a way that reaches their mind. And so once I was taught differently, I excelled. You couldn't give me, I mean, I remember my mom could not keep enough books in the house. Like we had like the, I read the whole babysitter club. I read the whole Sweet Valley High. Like she just could not buy them fast enough for me. But it was like up until then, like I never, ever want to read Cat in the Hat ever again. Like because they tortured me with all that until I got the proper teaching. And it's like once you teach a dyslexic how to read, they know. And then they're, I mean, for me, I was okay after that. Do you remember, so you were in a, in a school with, 
really small class size. You said five, like yes. five students. So total. my second grade year, there were five kids in my class, and I think it moved up to like 12 um, as I got into the higher grades, um, but they were always small. And um, they were very structured in the way they taught, which was super helpful for ADHD. Um, I, I remember like it was very set, like what was expected of you. And so like my, um, my basis of learning, like my core beginning was very, very solid. And that really helped me to cope as I got into the higher grades. Also, I was put on Adderall, which is, was, I think, super helpful as well. Okay. So it was structured was it an like an eight hour day or did yep. was the academic structured and then you had other things that allowed you to, to... It, it was kind of like a normal like school day um i remember we had to wear uniforms um but it was like they the expectations and the way they taught was just i think it was different than what i've seen in the schools here like i feel like they really built off of like a core idea and then you, they would introduce one thing at a time. And it was just like the way they taught was not as overwhelming, I feel like. Were, in terms of getting your interest level in reading up, did that just happen naturally after you felt more comfortable with your skills? Or was that something that they worked on to support while you were there? Like letting you read books that you were interested in or books that were more at, at, maybe at a different level than other students? How did, that, how did they do that? So I just remember that as I was learning how to read that my mom would take me to the bookstore and then we would pick out things that I was interested in. And then as I got like, I loved the babysitter club books. So then I just couldn't read them fast enough. <laughs> and it was like, so I found, she found books that like I loved as a kid. And then I got really, and I remember I read a lot of Agatha Christie, like the mystery books. Were there any books that you recall really disliking? Yes. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, really? I hate Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I felt How like come? I was tortured by Dr. Seuss because it was nonsense, like uh, all of his rhyming and like I needed a story. It just seemed silly and fluffy and annoying to me. So, um, so yeah, so I, I feel like for me, it was really helpful because I think what happens a lot of times is kids are not caught early enough and they, they feel what I felt in first grade that, whoa, I'm different. And there's something wrong with me. Why can't I keep up with everybody? And I think that can really mess with a child's self-esteem. And so I think it's so important. And I would argue that really every child in first grade should be tested just to make sure nothing's being missed because the ramifications of missing this will profoundly be, de I feel, detrimental to a, a kid. Sure, certainly, and they're learning. But then, like you said, if they're turned off to reading and the self-esteem that comes with that. I mean, you're so fortunate that you had parents who that noticed. That noticed and yes, and advocated for me. I think as a parent, I think, you know, it's a scary thing as a parent to see your kids struggling. And I think sometimes parents want to brush it under the rug or they just go to the school and the school's like, oh, they're fine, blah, blah, blah. And you as a parent have to look at your child. You know them better than anybody else. And really see are they okay or are they not okay and then advocate even if other people are telling you you're wrong because they other people told me I was wrong with my kids and I followed my gut intuition that said nope they're wrong I know better I'm their mother which is what my mother did and I think as parents we really have to do that to look out for them so their approach shaped you in your life and then in turn shaped your perspective parenting I as guess a, yeah yeah it's huge so, um, yeah, so for me, um, I was okay until I got into Spanish, and then Spanish was horrible for me, <laughs> and I really struggled with Spanish, and I did the bare minimum. I lived in Georgia, so we only had to take two years of Spanish in high school, so I survived it, and then I got to college, and I moved out to Colorado, and they required three, and so I just could not um, do it, and so fortunately, I had my testing history, and I was able to be put in a special class that they really made it pretty dumb down for, hmm. for me to survive it. Um, and yeah, so, so grateful for the testing again. Did you have to do additional testing as well? Or was that carried through from your K through 12? And I, that was really the only time I ever did it. So I don't know if things probably have changed now, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So an early intervention and an early understanding shifted your perspective and who knows where things might have gone for you had you not huge 
It was huge because instead of, I, I would not have, if I had not, I would have floundered all through elementary school. I think I would have probably thought I was dumb and I would not be the, I don't think I'd be the person I am. I, I, I and I love to read and that would have been such a shame to not have that. How does knowing that you have dyslexia, how does that affect your life now? Well, it's really cool. So like as I've gotten older, I never really thought about it when I was younger because, you know, I learned how to read and it like didn't really impact me for, I mean, it did, but I didn't really, I, my sister teases me. I don't think I ever learned the day, the months in order until I was probably in college, <laughs> but you know, I just kind of bounced along and, um, well now as an adult being dyslexic, is super cool. Um, and the more I've like learned about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. So like I have the ability to kind of think in 3d. And um, it's like my friend who was a designer laughed at me one time. She's like, Megan, it's like you can walk around in your head. Like I was like we were renovating our house and I don't know anything about architectural stuff. I don't know anything about design, but like I could picture everything done and walk around in my head in it. And um, so I, I'm extremely creative and just like get all fired up about creative stuff um and uh it's been really cool and that is i think related to the dyslexia so i think um and it what's interesting is my son is also dyslexic he can like build really crazy stuff for his age and that was one of the reasons why i picked up earlier on the fact that i thought he was dyslexic because it's like an un like normal ability to like design things mm -hmm. which is kind of cool so i think actually being dyslexic is like kind of a superpower I was going to ask you about some of the gifts associated with dyslexia and how you feel those. Um, you talk about 3D, so I think spatially, but are there other ways? It seems like a lot of people with dyslexia, they can make connections that are not as, they're not straightforward, but they're, I guess that's what you mean by 3D. Right. They're pulling things out of all over the place. And whereas, making and creating from it. Yeah. And it's really a cool, it's been, a, that is very true and it's really cool. So I can do that with design, but I can also do it with like people. Like I can find connections with people and introduce them to each other. Um, I'm able to uh, help people emotionally because I can make connections very easily. Um, so it helps me in lots of different realms of my life. So as a mother with dyslexia, tell me a little bit about how you, or where your concerns grew with your children, if you had suspicions about them having dyslexia, was it what you noticed and you recognized from your own life, from your own childhood, or were you just more aware, as you said, of the importance of testing early and you just wanted to rule it out? So, so with my children, with um, my oldest, um, I picked up really quickly on his, in a, he's very bright, but he has a really hard time focusing on anything we kind of call him tigger because he kind of bounces all over the place <laughs> and super sweet kid but like cannot sit down and focus on anything and my husband who doesn't really know much about this world um like I remember we were doing homework with him in first grade and he's like he just won't pay attention and was getting so frustrated and that was kind of like oh he's probably ADD so um I got him tested very early and sure enough he was and that was super helpful because after we got his medication correct, he like went from he had uh, I found out he'd been hiding his papers in his desk because he couldn't get them done fast enough because he couldn't focus on. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as his medication was right, he started being able to get it done. And his whole self esteem changed too because I uh, he was you could tell he was starting to feel bad about himself. And so it was very interesting, um, the change and, and medicating him made a profound difference for him. And um, also I have to work closely with the teachers. Okay, I was gonna ask you, for, and I wanna get to that, um, how did you approach this with him? How did you introduce him to the possibility that there may have been some other struggles that were affecting? So I just told him, I was like, you probably, um, before we got him tested, probably have ADD like me. It's not a big deal, Like, um, but if you know, then we can help you with it. And how did he take that? I think because I didn't make it into like a big issue, he was cool with it. Like, I think it's really how you, if you're like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever, then they're going to like react and think there's something really wrong with him. But I just, it was just like, hey, like saying you have purple hair. Like, it's not like if you normalize whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Do you know? Okay. You talked about being very open with 
your son's parent or with their teachers and talking with them about this and advocating? How did that process go? So once I um, discovered that he had ADD and, and processing, um, auditory processing, I uh, went to the school and sat down with the teacher and really like went over his testing and the suggestions that were made for how to help him in the classroom. And really, I've had to stay active in advocating for him um, because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of kids in the classroom and a lot of it gets like brushed aside. And so, uh, for example, we have to make sure he in his agenda that the teacher signs off that he's written everything down in it. Uh, and then I have to sign off. And that, so it's like it keeps everybody accountable. Um, and so that's been really huge. Um, yeah, yeah. So and does does your son have dyslexia as well? Um, my oldest does not. My youngest does. So then my youngest, I started to notice, he, they kept telling me he was fine. And he's clearly really smart, but like he was just on the like low tier for reading and it didn't click for me. I was like, there's something going on here. And then I noticed like the alphabet was it, like a really a struggle for him. And then one day I saw him creating this like incredible 3D thing on Minecraft. It was like a, a airplane and it looked like something that like an adult would have created. And I thought, oh, he's totally dyslexic. It, like just clicked. I was like, that explains it. But everybody told me I was wrong. He's fine. He's fine. And I thought when I saw that plane, I thought, nope, he's dyslexic. And so I brought him in for testing and sure enough, he is dyslexic. Was he reading at all? Was he avoiding it or just mixing up letters or sounds? He or was, was it just so he was kind of like doing it, but but on a he was way behind. And it just he was like the top and like on the high level for math, but then he was like really low in reading. But it was he was high enough that like they didn't they're like, oh, he's fine. But it's like you have to look at the full picture of the child. If they're really doing well in math, but their reading is not good, it should be kind of around the same realm, I would think. Um, and also, he can talk about really sophisticated things, but it's like his reading was so there was just there was something that was not clicking there. And I think that's always a sign that you should get your child tested if something just if the whole picture just doesn't add up. Yeah, it makes sense. Certainly, from from my point of view, that you would have an assessment done just so that you know sort of where things are and you can monitor that. And right. You just have a lot of questions answered without right. trying to guess about it. The way I look at it is it's like, wouldn't you rather, it's like you could, so if I had gotten him tested and, there, and I was told, oh, he's fine, well, then I know, right? But I, what if I didn't get him tested and then he went on to really struggle? It's like, it, it, it was a no-brainer. You're better off just finding out the answer. So you've covered, maybe you've covered this question I'm about ready to ask, but I just wanted to throw it out there anyway. What would you tell a parent who may share similar concerns but is fearful of their child having a, a diagnosis or a label, um, which is totally understandable, but right. what, what would you tell them? So for both of my children, it's been profoundly helpful. I've been able to sit down to the, with them and explain because my youngest, the, the one who's dyslexic, was really struggling and his self-esteem had tanked. And when I, I can't even explain to you the relief in his eyes when I explained to him what was going on. And I talked to him about all of the really cool things about being dyslexic, but that when you're small and you're turning to read, that's like the hardest part of it. And he did like a 180. His self-esteem came back because he realized there really wasn't anything wrong with him. He just learns differently. He was able to separate out that issue from okay. him as a, as a person. Right, and as, and because his he was internalizing it before. And I think that like it's profoundly helpful for children. It, it makes them feel because they know they know something is different about them. And if you bring it into the light, then they're able to process it and really understand how their brain works. And it's, I mean, it has transformed my dyslexic son. His, now he has all these friends where he was struggling in friendships before because he understands who he is now. And that's been really helpful. And I think also, like for example, with me, it was really helpful to know because then when I couldn't do Spanish, I was able to go back and say, here's my testing. Like, and I had a track record to explain to people so I could have different um because i shouldn't have if 
it shouldn't keep me from being able to do things that I want to do. I might never be able to speak five languages, but it would have been awful if I couldn't have made it through college because they were keeping me to that. Being able to have the testing is like, it gives you the ability to ask for what you need. Yeah, that makes sense. What I'm hearing too is just a lot of, it seems like just a lot of honesty and a willingness to be a little bit vulnerable and acknowledging that everybody has gifts mm -hmm. and we all have struggles struggles as well. Yeah. And, and that's okay. To know those. Right. And I, and I think, you know, I think it's good for kids to understand that like what, what their brain looks like and also that that's okay. Like they know that I've had similar issues and I wouldn't even call them issues I, that my brain also works in a similar way to theirs. And that's been kind of fun and bonding. And I don't, I think people like think, oh, this is a disability and they think it's this heavy, dark thing, but it's not. It's uh, once you understand it, really, it's just that a child needs different learning tools. Knowing everything that you do, do you do you ever feel anxious or um, do you do you still do you ever have thoughts creep in about dyslexia? You know, like the, the voices or the, the by voices, I mean. Negative I'm not thoughts. Not good enough, or yeah. I, no, you know. honestly, I actually this is going to sound bad, but I kind of feel bad for people who aren't dyslexic, <laughs> <laughs> because um, I'm able to do things that other people can't, and it's like super cool. So that's the part I also try to explain to my kids. It's like, yes, it's hard when you're learning to read, but in the real world, I mean, in the real world, being dyslexic is an advantage. They say it's like something like forty percent of self-made millionaires are dyslexic. Like it, it gives you the upper hand in real life. Yeah, there's actually a really great TED Talk, and I can't remember who gives it. I'm going to share it on our social media as well. I think we have in the past, but um, this is, I think he's a teacher, and he talks about some yeah. of the research around dyslexia. I think it's called The Gift. Is it the called gift The Gift of, of dyslexia? dyslexia? I think, yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah, and he talks about how we're entering this period of time you know, for the last 100 years or whatever, or actually ever since the invention of the printing press. Right. The deck has kind of been stacked against nonverbal learners and dyslexics right. and things with the internet and all the technology that we have and just the way things are going, it's shifting the other way so that right. this is really their time to shine. Well, and I think one of the big pieces of that is like what we need in the world right now is creative people. The, the computers are going to be able to do the other stuff. You need the people that are creating and that's dyslexics. That's and a really so good point. I think that's huge. Like, um, and so that's one of the things that I've been talking to about um, as like with my son and then a bunch of his friends that we found out that are also dyslexic. It, when I sit down and explain to them the potential, like the, that this is hard now, but this is actually a huge gift that they're going to be able to lean into as they get older. I think it gets them kind of fired up and excited about it, which is something I think that's important to do with kids is to show them the magical pieces of having a different brain. Have you talked with, do you have friends with dyslexia or other family members? Have you talked about this? Yeah. Um, well, so my mom probably is dyslexic. And so as I've gone on this journey and like learned more about it, it's been actually super helpful for her as well, I think, to like learn about it. And she's like, oh gosh, that makes so much sense as she's gotten older, like, and she looks back and I, and I think um, I have friends whose kids are dyslexic. And so I've talked to them a lot about it. Um, have you heard, have they, as they've discovered some of the gifts associated with dyslexia, have you been surprised or, or really noticed any particular gifts maybe that you didn't experience that somebody else did? I'm just wondering if. Well, like um, some people, I know that like uh, some dyslexics really excel in like engineering and like mathematical things. And so I think that is like, perf I, I was good at math, especially geometry. But um, I tend to go more towards the creative things. But it can also have uh, people, they say like it's the disease of MIT. Have you heard? I have. Yeah. yeah. There's a really high percentage, I guess, of right. MIT students that have dyslexia. Right. So it's super cool. And I, I think that might be why my son is really good at math. Yeah. So. Well, this is, this is amazing. We were talking for quite a while before I hit the record button and... I could go on asking you questions and we could keep talking about it. I think we're at roughly 20 minutes. Okay. So do you have, are there any other last thoughts that you wanted to, you're welcome to come on and talk about this or any other issue anytime you want to. Yeah. This has been fantastic. Is there oh, anything good. else you want to say before we sign off? I would just encourage parents to, to go deeper, to, to test their kids, find out what's going on with them, to advocate for them, to explain to them like, 
to really sit down with them and be empathetic to them and explain to them what's going on. And um, I think that it can be profoundly helpful for them. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's everybody's brain works differently. Sounds like it is what you make of it. Exactly. That's what I think. Yeah, that's that's a really great point to end on. Thanks again for coming on, Megan. We yeah. really appreciate it. I can't wait to get this out and for people to hear this. Thank you. I'm excited about it. All right. That's it from us today. As always, you can find more information as well as resources on our website, individualmatters.org. We hope you'll join us the next podcast where we'll continue to explore topics around successful living, learning and education, and child development and share ways to help you live a more positive and fulfilling life. Thank you.